I was able to spend time this morning with the Grant County Church. They are a fine and very small group of people. I mentioned there were about 20 there total. And Mark Eubank said, oh, a big church. <laughs> because where he preached this morning, there were 11. So I guess they almost doubled it. Good church, good people, I've known them for a long time. Got to hear on the way home Daniel's messages this morning. I thought he did a fantastic job. I think Daniel has become a, a real good speaker, deep in topic, and I loved everything he had to say. He talked this morning about knowing God and then being strengthened by God. Well, I want to continue that thought. If you want to go into the book of Ephesians and turn to chapter 4, and we're going to bounce around through the book a little bit, but I want us to think about a phrase that in thinking about how he was presenting his material, this phrase began to circulate in my head. And it's a phrase that I've never preached on before, never connected it with another place in the book that I think helps us understand it. But I want us to see, he says in chapter 4 and in verse 25, members of one another. Why is it that Paul wanted the Ephesians to know God, because we're members of one another. Why did he want them to have strength that comes from God? Because we are members of one another, and we're all members together in the same place. But this phrase, members of one another, I think is an interesting phrase that we need to see and we need to understand. And so in a moment, I'm going to connect it with another phrase, and I think thereby gain an understanding that will be very beneficial to our daily lives. Before we define the term, I'm going to use the idea of a funnel. We're going to start wide and we're going to start bringing it down until we get to the final point to see what's going on here. Before we specify what this means, members of one another, I want to suggest in the first place that there is a theme, this idea of one another, members of one another, is all throughout the text of the book of Ephesians. There are phrases that I think are very important. Chapter 1 and verse number 15, he talked about their love for all the saints. Their love for all the saints. The saints. Chapter 2 and verse 19, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. We are together. Chapter 2 and verse 22, you are being built up together to a house of God. That idea of togetherness shows up again. Chapter 4. In verse 16, you are joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I really like that terminology, and I think it's going to become even more real down at the bottom of the funnel, if you will. So the joints, connectedness, is a part of this idea of being members of one another. And then chapter 5 and verse 21, submitting to one another. This idea of members of one another in a broad sense is something that Paul discussed throughout this entire letter to the Ephesians. 
I want to suggest to you that when he, as Daniel put it, encouraged them to know God and to gain strength from God, he was writing to the church, not just to these individuals to do this. He was saying, I want all of you to do this, the church at Ephesus to do this. Why? Because we are members of one another. Now, there may be many reasons in the book for which Paul gave this message that Daniel presented this morning. But I want to suggest this is one of them. One of the reasons he told this is because he wants us to think about this idea of being members of one another. So, let's begin narrowing the funnel. What is this word members of one another all about? What does it mean to be members? This word has its origin. The use of the word was when you go to war, all of the implements that were used in war were called the members. Each member, the sword, the knife, the shield. All of those were members of war. That's how they used the word. They also used the word, number two, for every single part, every working part of a ship. So that the ship was what it was because of every single part used to make up that ship. Now, Paul then becomes very clear, very descriptive in Ephesians, giving us the concept, like the original word of war and ship, he gives us an image in the book of Ephesians that helps us to see this members concept. Chapter 1, verse 23. Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body. The body image throughout the book of Ephesians. Chapter 2, and verse 16. Jesus came to reconcile Jews and Gentiles into one body. And then in chapter 4 and in verse 4, he made it clear that there is only one body and no more. Chapter 4 and verse number 12. He set up, God did, the church and put the leaders in order and the people in order for the equipping of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then that phrase again in chapter 4, verse 16, the whole body, which every joint and every ligament supplies nourish nourishment to that body, the body image is filled up in the book of Ephesians. It's in chapter 5. Christ is the head of the body, which is his church, the body image. Chapter 5, verse 28. Chapter 5, verse 30. He is talking about the body of Christ. So in the first place, in understanding this idea of being members of one another, he is saying this, every single one of us is an active part of the whole. We are members of the whole. We're not just a bunch of individuals. Any more than we would say that a ship is just a bunch of parts. It's not. It is an organism. It works together. It's a wholeness. We are members of one another. Let's 
narrow the image even more. I want you to go to chapter 5, and I want you to notice in the second place the most picturesque view of this idea, members one of another. This is why I want to give you a phrase that I think will join all of this together. Look at chapter 5, verse 30. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Now, I will tell you, I have never preached what it means to be a member of the flesh and bones of Jesus. Never preached it. I've never heard it preached. I didn't look for anybody who's preached about it. I just thought, now that's interesting. What's he talking about? What's he saying? We're members of Christ's flesh and bones? Well, let's see if we can figure this out. Now, this chapter, this section of the chapter, has an intentional purpose behind it. Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery. But I speak of what? Christ and the church. Now, this text, this immediate context, chapter 5, verses 22 to the end of the chapter, was not generated primarily to say, this is how to have a proper marriage. That's not the point. Oh, sure, we can learn about that. But the point is, I want you to understand the church. And therefore, it seems to me that what Paul is saying is, I can help you understand the church if I can help you understand proper marriage. Because we're familiar with that. That makes a little sense to us. But for us to say we are members of his flesh and of his bones, what is that idea? He's talking about the church. Let's put all that together. Now, I want to suggest to you that this idea is a reality and a goal. A reality and a goal. It is real that we are members of one another and members of Christ. That's real. But it's also a goal. We have a goal to continue the reality. We will never perfect it. We're never completed. We're never finished. It's never over. We can never sit down and say we figured it all out. But what we can say is, I know by fact, reality says, I'm a member of Christ and we are of each other. But what is my goal? Well, my goal is to make sure I continue that reality. Well, let's see what he's talking about. Let's consider the reality. The reality is, verse 22 through 24, we are married to Christ. If we are part of the Lord's church, we are married to Jesus. We, in reality, are His. We belong to Him. We are married to Him. Now, what does that reality demand? Again, let's see this text 
not from the place that we usually consider it, the marriage relationship. Let's consider it from the place that Paul said was his main intent, using the figure of marriage. What does the reality of being married to Christ demand? Number one, it demands that I notice the text. I have to be one who is willing to say, as the text says, Jesus is the head. I therefore am submissive. I need to be under him. I need to say, this is who I'm going to listen to. It's who I'm going to follow. If I am under Christ, if I am married to Christ, now I have responsibility. We can see that in marriage because we can't even imagine the idea that says, I want to be married, but I don't want to have any responsibilities. That doesn't make any sense. When you get married, you're deciding, okay, I am now responsible, not only for me, but also for you. What is he saying? We're married to Christ. We have a responsibility, not only for me, but I have responsibility for you. And you have responsibility for me. And we all have responsibility for Jesus. Because we're married to him. This text helps us to understand number one. It demands in reality that I lose myself. Submit to Christ. I lose myself. Isn't that what he's talking about? Isn't that the idea? Can a person really be in a physical marriage relationship and not lose him or herself to the other person? The answer is no, it won't be proper. I'm married to Jesus. The demand is that I lose myself. But number two, the demand is that I find myself. Christ loved the church. Verse 25, gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present himself a glorious church, not having spot or blemish or any such thing, but holy and without blame. When we marry, we find ourselves in ways we could not when we were single. When God designed marriage, He never designed it as something that He expected every single individual to do. But here's what He did. He said, when you do it, you will find yourself in ways you did not before when you were single. The reality is I'm married to Jesus. And the demand is in being married, I have to lose myself, but then I have to find myself in that marriage relationship. That's what he describes when he says the church is sanctified and cleansed. Now that's the reality. So how do we maintain that reality? How do we keep it going? That's where I want to back up to our text of chapter 4, starting in verse 25. And I want you to look at it 
in a little bit different way, not much, but a little bit. So that I want you, us to understand the connectedness that we have. We are members one of another. Therefore, that reality being true, how do I maintain the reality of being a member of one another? Well, the first thing he says is, you got to speak the truth, but not in an angry way. Verses 25 through 26. Put away lying. Each of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we're members of one another. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. He expects us. We maintain this membership with one another when we are constantly speaking the truth, but not in an angry fashion where it gets away from us, the sinful anger. Doesn't that work in the physical marriage relationship? Don't we need to be with each other truthful if we're married to somebody? But you don't use or speak the truth written on a frying pan cracked upside the head. That's speaking truth. But that's not how it works. So the first thing we do to maintain that, he says here, number two. Stop stealing And start giving. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who is in need. Do you think the main point is to say, don't steal? I don't think so. I do not, I've never heard of any society or any place or any organization that said, with us, we encourage stealing. Has anybody ever encouraged stealing? We start really young teaching that's not right. You've been in a situation, right? Two little kids in a walker. Can't talk, can't walk. They got pacifiers. But one takes the pacifier from the other one. Ain't that cute? No mom does that. Mom says, we don't do that. And you give it back. Not to steal is just common sense. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is... You quit being selfish. You quit thinking about you, and you start thinking about other people. It's not what you can get. It's what you can give. And that's how you maintain being members of one another. I may not come steal your car. None of us would. But might we steal someone's reputation by passing on a piece of gossip that never should have been said? Might we steal away someone's innocence by enticing them into something they should not be doing? He's not just talking about stealing. He's talking about being members of one another. And finally, third, quit grieving the Spirit and start giving through the Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed. What causes the Holy Spirit to be grieved? 
bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice. That's when the Holy Spirit is grieved. But Paul says, turn that around. Instead of grieving the Holy Spirit, give people what comes from the Holy Spirit, which is be kind and forgive. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit sealed you in kindness, in forgiveness, therefore you do as well. We're at the bottom of the funnel. Let's define what it means to be members of one another, of his flesh and of his bones. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was the incarnation of God in the world. Through Jesus, in his flesh and bones, he revealed who God was to a world who needed to know. We are members of one another, of his flesh and his bones. Because Christians are the incarnation of Jesus to this world. People know Jesus through us. People get a view of Jesus through their view of us. We really are today the flesh and bones of Jesus in the physical world. We're members of one another. Now think of all the ways that we could use that. When one weeps, we all weep. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When one has a burden, we all have a burden. Because we're members of one another, of his flesh and of his bones. And in so doing, in living that way, we really do come to know God. And we really do find the strength that the knowledge of God can provide to us when we really become members of one another. I hope this discussion has been helpful. And I hope we all can commit to thinking more about the membership we have with each other and be careful of what we say and do. But tonight, if you're not a member of Jesus, you don't know what real life is all about. And if any one of us is in need of the help of this membership, we want to be available, not only tonight, but whenever. Our shepherds will be here. Will you meet us at the front if we can help you? Let's stand together.